Welcome back to Reliving the War, the show where we compare WWF Raw and WCW Nitro to see which show was the best. As a quick heads up, we struck a new deal with the big wigs at TBS and we have moved to Thursday nights. Reliving the War will now be available every Thursday going forward. We have a special episode this week. This will be the final Reliving the War of 1995 as Nitro went unopposed on Christmas Day. The next ratings battle occurred on January 1st, 1996. So yeah, this episode of Reliving the War marks the end of 95. I will of course talk about the December 25th episode of Nitro next week and go through the results of that show along with the Starcade 1995 details. This episode of Reliving the War also features one of the most talked about segments of the whole Monday Night War. You saw the video thumbnail, so yeah, this week is quite the landmark episode. Before we get started, let's look at the In Your House 5 results. The December 1995 WWF show has one of the lowest buy rates of any pay-per-view in WWE history, and it's no wonder either. Folks who watch this show every week would have noticed that the WWF didn't bother to build this show up at all on Monday Night Raw, and there was a serious lack of hype for In Your House 5. Anyway, Goldust appeared during the Razor Ramon and Marty Jannetty vs Sid and the Kid match. The Bizarre One sits at the entranceway, and he applauds Razor Ramon during during the entrances. Todd Pettengill interviews Goldust during the match. Goldust talks about how good the bad guy looks before giving Todd an envelope addressed to Razor Ramon. Gennady and Razor win the tag match. Dean Douglas came out for his match with Ahmed Johnson. Dean announced that he has been sidelined with that back injury we talked about a few weeks ago, but Douglas has a replacement, the nature boy Buddy Landell. The audience could be heard groaning as the Ric Flair ripoff makes his way to the ring. Ahmed wins with the Pearl River Plunge at around the 42nd mark. Double J, a uh, returning Double J, had been providing commentary for this match and he attacked Ahmed Johnson afterwards along with Jerry Lawler. Ahmed ends up absorbing the punishment before chasing Double J to the back. Razor Ramon gets handed the envelope from Goldust in the next segment. He looks puzzled as he reads the letter. Hunter Hearst Helmsley won the infamous Arkansas Hogpen match against Henry Godwin, but Hunter also ended up getting thrown in the Hogpen after the match. Diesel tried to get some revenge for Shawn Michaels when Big Daddy Cool battled Owen Hart. Owen won the match via disqualification when Diesel pushed the referee, but Owen still took two jackknife powerbombs before heading to the back. Diesel signalled afterwards that he wanted a WWF title shot in the future. The Undertaker defeated King Mabel in a casket match. The Undertaker got the urn back, well he got the chain back, and Taker also signalled that he wanted a WWF title shot in the near future. Finally, Bret Hart and Davey Boy Smith had the best match of the evening, a complete bloodbath where the hitman successfully defended his WWF Championship. At the very end of the show, it's announced that The Undertaker is the new number one contender for the WWF title. Diesel has words with the phenom as the show goes off the air. Needless to say, if you haven't seen Bret vs Bulldog at In Your House 5, go check it out as soon as possible. The rest of In Your House was quite forgettable, unfortunately. Raw's live tonight from New York, Delaware, and Nitro is live from Augusta, Georgia. Vince McMahon and Jerry Lawler let us know that tonight's Raw will feature an intercontinental title match pitting champion Razor Ramon against Yokozuna. While over on Nitro, Eric Bischoff tells us that the macho man Randy Savage will defend his WCW title against the Giant. Eric Bischoff and company are then interrupted by Alundra Blaze, who we had just seen a few weeks ago on Monday Night Raw. Blaze announces that she's now going back to her Medusa name, and in one of the most talked about moments of the Monday Night War, Medusa drops the WWF Women's Championship into a trash can. Medusa says here, I am Medusa, always have been Medusa, and always will be Medusa. This is the WWF Women's Championship belt. 
Medusa then drops the belt into the trash can, going on to say, and that's what I think of the WWF Women's Championship belt. This is the WCW, and I am now in the WCW, and they used to call me a Lundra Blaze, but not anymore. This is where the big boys play, and now this is where the big girls play. <laughs> Shots fired. This was all Eric Bischoff's idea, by the way. Medusa wasn't so sure if she should go through with this, but Eric was very convincing. And I think it was a great move. It sure got people talking and it sure pissed off Vince McMahon. This little stunt would get mentioned in the upcoming lawsuit that the WWF put forward against WCW over unfair competition. But anyway, excellent start to Nitro. You may have forgotten that William the Refrigerator Perry shows up after Medusa also, but that was wasn't nearly as eventful. The refrigerator is apparently going to provide security for the WCW commentary team. Let's look at the Nitro opening match then while we're here. WCW starts off with Eddie Guerrero vs Ric Flair while the WWF presents Fatu vs Jeff Jarrett. Ric Flair is in complete nature boy mode here. He's styling and profiling in the ring, delaying the initial lockup with Eddie by pandering to the audience and strutting around the squared circle. The August the audience is behind the nature boy here. Eddie outsmarts Flair a few times in the early moments of the match and when Guerrero mocks Flair with the nature boy strut, the crowd boos. Eddie has a counter for everything Flair does. The nature boy goes for the figure four but Guerrero catches Flair with a small package, only getting a two count for his efforts. Flair gets the upper hand briefly after delivering a big boot in the corner but Eddie gets the better of Flair after exchanging chops and punches. And eventually Eddie goes to the top row but Flair manages to push him off. Eddie injures his knee and the nature boy goes for the kill. Flair brings Eddie back in the ring, locking in the figure four while also using the ropes as leverage. Eddie won't submit, he passes out, and Flair scores the pinfall win. Keep in mind that Flair said a few weeks ago on Nitro that Eddie was underneath him and Brand Pillman wrestled Guerrero instead of Flair. This week, Eddie wouldn't submit to the figure four and Guerrero came out of the match still looking pretty good. After the match, Mean Jane tries to get a word with Ric Flair who has been joined by Arn Anderson. Kevin Sullivan comes to the ring saying that Brian Pullman better watch what he says, reminding Flair and Anderson of the smack Pullman was talking last week. Anderson says if the Dungeon of Doom go after Brian Pullman, then the Dungeon of Doom will also run into the Four Horsemen. So we have a little feud kicking off here that would lead to a very interesting Pullman vs Sullivan match in the future. Over on Raw, Jeff Jarrett is in the ring ready to take on Make a Difference Fatu. It's crazy how similar the opening moments of this match is when comparing to the Flair vs Guerrero match. Jeff Jarrett stalls the action by strutting around the ring and when Fatu gets the upper hand, he mocks Jarrett by doing the strut. Crazy. Fatu chases Jarrett outside the ring and when the action gets back inside, Jeff Jarrett hits a big DDT that Fatu no-sells, getting up to his feet and giving us a little dance. Double J turns things around with a swinging knack breaker, the fight spills to the outside and when we come back from commercials, Double J is still in control. Jared hits two double axe handles from the top rope before whipping Fatu from one corner to the next. Fatu is able to counter the third double axe handle before delivering a power slam. As Vince McMahon tells us, there will be a special music presentation later on in the show based around Shawn Michaels' recent injury. Fatu hurts himself after performing a cutter. The big man begins favouring his left shoulder. Double J goes on the attack and as Double J signals for the figure four, Ahmed Johnson runs in. Ahmed attacks Jarrett. Double J manages to run away and the match is ruled in Jarrett's favour. It's a DQ finish. Ahmed raises Fatu's hand as Double J is seen running to the back. Point for Nitro here. The Fatu versus Double J match wasn't as bad as I was anticipating, but Flair versus Guerrero was simply better. Promos next, we have Gorilla Monsoon and Goldust getting a little mic time on Raw while the commentary team on Nitro were interrupted by Sergeant Craig Pittman. 
William the Refrigerator Perry had one job, provide security for the commentators, and yet Craig Pittman just walks on up there and causes a scene. Anyway, Pittman approaches Bobby Heenan about the brain becoming the sergeant's new manager. Heenan says that he's now a broadcast journalist, so he can't manage Craig to the world title. Heenan says though that he would get in touch with a few guys who could maybe help Pittman out. I think it'll take more than a new manager to help this guy out, but yeah, at least WCW were trying to put new talent on TV screens, no matter what you may think of Sergeant Craig Pittman. Over on Raw, Gorilla Monsoon talks about the Royal Rumble, officially announcing the Bret Hart vs Undertaker WWF title match that will take place at the pay-per-view. Monsoon also tells us that Ahmed Johnson will face Double J at the Royal Rumble event, and the Royal Rumble match participants will start getting announced this week on Superstars. We then get a pre-recorded promo from Goldust. Goldust addresses Razor Ramon by saying the bizarre one and the bad guy have an unbreakable bond that reeks of taboo, and the pair should have a go at oozing machismo together. Quick side note, Razor hated this program he was now getting involved in. It wasn't so much that he didn't like Dustin Runnels, but he didn't think too much of the Goldust gimmick and the suggestive character. Anyway, easy point for Monday Night Raw here. We have some matches next, Nature Boy Buddy Landell vs Bob Holly on Raw, and Nitro gives us Lex Luger vs Marcus Bagwell. Let's stick with Raw, before the match gets underway, Doc Hendricks is here to shield some merchandise. I think Barry Dodinsky is now gone from the WWF and Doc is now the new mayor of merchandise. I could be wrong, but it looks like Barry is shilling merchandise somewhere else as 1995 comes to a close. Anyway, WrestleMania the arcade game, a wrestling bios feel favorite is available on Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis and PlayStation. Order now and get a strategy guide videotape. In the ring, Bob Holly takes control early on with a few arm drags, but the veteran Landell is able to turn the tides, cutting down Holly's offense with some chops and punches. Holly is now wrestling from underneath as Landell slows the match down with an armbar followed by a camel clutch. Incredibly boring stuff here from WWF Raw. This match has no heat whatsoever. Bob Holly hits a DDT. Landell gets up before Holly, but he hits a series of punches that Holly completely no sells. Holly hits a Frankensteiner that looked pretty nice, but Landell is able to score the win with his corkscrew elbow drop. This was brutal. Lex Luger comes to the ring for his match against Mark. Marcus Bagwell, the future buff daddy gets outsmarted by Luger during the opening moments of the match. Lex is so happy that he gives Jimmy Hart a high five, but Bagwell fires back with some offense of his own, catching the total package off guard with a big monkey flip. Luger gets frustrated when Bagwell knocks him to the outside of the ring. Luger is able to slow Lex down a little, but Bagwell fights back, hitting a back body drop on Luger, and to be honest, it's quite surprising how much time Bagwell is getting on the offense here. Bagwell hits a big flying forearm before going for a splash. Luger gets his knees up and this right here takes the fire right out of Marcus. Lex follows up with a power slam and then the torture rack is applied. Lex wins via submission. After the match, Luger and Jimmy Hart get some promo time. Jimmy reminds the fans that Lex Luger is the uncrowned champion of WCW. And Lex, well, Lex says this. I mean the champion that every day I wake up in the morning and look at it in the mirror that I am and will become. And it's a point for Nitro. The Landell vs Holly match dragged on and went nowhere. Luger vs Bagwell was exactly what it needed to be, straight to the point. Even in defeat here, Bagwell also looked pretty good. Sting is going to take on Earl Robert Eaton on Nitro while Raw gives us another brother love segment, this time it's with Ted DiBiase. Now on surface level, this brother love segment seems like a throwaway promo but when we look at the bigger picture of the Monday Night War, this promo is fairly noteworthy. At In Your House 5, a bogus Santa Claus attacked Savio Vega and Ted DiBiase says that this Santa Claus is evil, his name is Santa Claus, he's from the South Pole and he takes presents from kids instead of handing them out. What's more, Santa Claus is the newest member of the Million Dollar Corporation. So what does this have to do with the bigger picture of the Monday Night War? Well, nothing really. It's what DiBiase says afterwards. Ted says that 1996 will be his year. Not only will Sid and the kid become tag team champions, but 1996 will also be the year of the Million Dollar Champion. 
very very soon someone would debut in the wwf and that same person would become dibiase's new million dollar champion and that man was none other than stone cold steve austin a superstar who would prove invaluable to the wwf in terms of gaining viewership in the years that followed still without this kind of 2020 hindsight the promo was mediocre at best sting comes out for his match with bobby eaton looking pretty hyped up the stinger gets the best of eaton to start the things off, poor Bobby hadn't been having much luck in WCW during the end of 1995, and while I thought the Blue Bloods gimmick was really entertaining, neither Eaton nor Regal were successful in the ring when it comes to wins and losses. Anyway, Eaton is able to go on offense when Sting plays up to the audience a little. Sting breaks out of an armbar, but Eaton fights back, eventually going to the top rope but missing a knee drop. This gives Sting an opportunity to hit a Stinger splash, followed by the Scorpion Deathlock. Lock. Eaton submits and it's another win for the Stinger on WCW Nitro. After the match, Sting gets interviewed by Mean Gene Okerlund. Sting is feeling good about his chances at Starcade, saying he hasn't forgotten what Ric Flair did to him at Halloween Havoc and the Stinger is also ready for Luger in the triangle match. It's another point for Nitro. The Raw promo is interesting for fans who want to see how the Ringmaster got introduced to the WWF, but the Stinger was on fire on Nitro. A short match, but it was still incredibly fun to watch. Main event time, WCW will present a world title match, Randy Savage defending against The Giant while we have an intercontinental title match over on Raw, Razor Ramon defending against Yokozuna. Goldust sits by the entranceway to keep an eye on Razor Ramon, gold glitter falls on Ramon as the bad guy stands in the ring, giving Yokozuna a chance to get an early attack in. Goldust watches on as Razor manages to throw Yokozuna to the outside of the ring, and it takes the big man a little time to get back inside the squared circle. At this point, Yokozuna had gained so much weight that it was really affecting his performances and his overall well-being, eventually leading to Vince McMahon releasing Yokozuna from his contract due to health concerns, but that's still a little while away. What you get here then with Yokozuna matches of this era is a bunch of stalling and time wasting. Yokozuna's opponents would have to work around the big man by locking in holds and delaying the inevitable breakup. Most of Razor's offense here comes from submission attempts and using Yokozuna's size against the big man. The bad guy moves out of the way of a sit down splash before locking in an arm bar. Yokozuna answers with a submission hold of his own and yeah this has been incredibly slow so far. The only real action has been when Razor tried to knock Yokozuna off his feet, but that's a spot we've seen hundreds of times by now. Yokozuna stops Razor's momentum with a big clothesline while looking incredibly tired. Razor gets up and Yokozuna falls to the mat after the bad guy delivers a series of punches. And when we get back from commercial break, the bad guy is once again in a submission hold. Razor finds a way out of the hold, but Yokozuna brings the fight to the corner, smothering Ramon with more punches and more holds and it feels like an absolute eternity. Razor fires back with a big clothesline of his own and just after Ramon delivers a top rope bulldog, the lights in the arena begin to flicker. The Undertaker makes his way to the ring with a casket, Yokozuna runs away in fear, and the match ends in a count out. You can actually read what Scott Hall is thinking by looking at his face, it was a poor main event here with a poor finish. After the match, Doc Hendricks questions Razor Ramon about Goldust. Razor said that the letter Goldust gave him at In Your House implied that the bizarre one had the hots for the bad guy. Razor says he only dates women, and if Goldust plays for the other team then that's absolutely fine, just don't come after the bad guy. Doc asks what exactly was in the letter. Razor says that WWF Raw is a family show and he'd rather tell Doc all about it backstage. Jerry Lawler says that he saw the letter and it was enough to even embarrass the king himself. McMahon and Lawler then hype up the Raw Bowl happening on the 1st of January 1996. We'll see a big 8-man tag special on the first Raw of 96. 
Before the Giant comes to the ring for his match with Randy Savage, Eric Bischoff lets us know that Halloween Havoc will be available on video cassette the very next day. You can now own the magic of Halloween Havoc 1995 forever with this VHS tape. They should have signed Barry Dodinsky for this stuff, that would have been the biggest signing of the Monday Night Wars, but anyway, Randy Savage comes to the ring holding the gold. While the story of Savage's injured arm has been played out in a manner of kayfabe over these past few weeks, Savage really was working hurt at this point, and he had some big matches coming up over the next week or so, so yeah, his schedule was full. This one here with the Giant was pretty good too, an incredible difference in comparison to Hulk Hogan's matches with Paul White. The Giant struggles to get his hands on Randy at the start of the match. The Macho Man tries to end things early by putting a sleeper hold on the Big Man, but the Giant slams Savage down. The Macho Man gets right back up and a knee to the Giant's back causes Jimmy Hart to fall off the ring apron. The Giant then goes on to dominate the match, stopping Savage with a big elbow to the back of the neck. After a body slam, the giant locks in a bear hug. We go to commercial and when we come back, the giant is still destroying Savage. Randy gets thrown out and into the ring. The giant then goes to the top rope, missing a giant splash that looked extremely impressive. This gives Savage a chance to go upstairs himself, delivering a beautiful elbow drop that the giant kicks out of with ease. The giant even follows up with a drop kick that again looked very impressive for a guy his size. The audience is going nuts at this sequence of moves, Savage and Giant have the crowd in the palm of their hands here as the fight spills to the outside. The Giant exposes the concrete floor but Savage is able to grab the ropes during a suplex attempt. The Giant no sells it before hitting the ring to deliver the choke slam. Just as it looks like the Giant is about to win the world title, Hulk Hogan interferes, hitting the Giant with a steel chair and causing a disqualification finish. You know when people say that Hulk Hogan was actually the biggest heel ever during his entire wrestling career yet no one really noticed? Yeah, this kind of stuff helps in backing up that theory. The Giant had beaten Savage fair and square here and Hulk Hogan, who has been on probation for weeks apparently, has once again stopped the title from changing hands by interfering in a title match. Hogan even hits the referee with a steel chair here for crying out loud. Who can stop this rampage of Hulkamania? Well, this was obviously a job for William the Refrigerator Perry and Steve Mongo McMichael. Hogan has words with the former football players before going back into the ring and tending to Randy Savage. And you know what else? While Hogan was going crazy with a steel chair and showing no remorse whatsoever, the audience were cheering for him. Who would have thought it? Another point for Nitro, the Giant was pretty damn good during this main event match while Yokozuna really struggled during Raw's final match. Here we go, the last segments, we're all going to get together and collectively ask Shawn Michaels to tell us a lie while Main Gene gets to the bottom of this Hulk Hogan business. Let's stick with Nitro while the main event is still fresh in our minds. Main Gene says Hulk Hogan is on thin ice due to this probation nonsense. Hogan says that's funny because Flair and the Giant are supposed to be on probation too, yet they are getting title opportunities. The Giant is getting held back by the Taskmaster and Sergeant Craig Pittman, yeah, okay. Hogan runs out and whacks everyone with the steel chair before dashing back into the ring. Hogan says he wants a shot at Randy Savage's title, like seriously doesn't the macho man have enough to deal with right now? Savage announces that he also has to defend the world title next week against Ric Flair on Nitro before facing Tenzan and the winner of the triangle match at Starcade, but afterwards Savage says he'll be happy to give Hogan a title shot. Hogan then sends a message to Mongo McMichael in the refrigerator telling the ex football players to stay out of his ring and mind their own business. Mongo explains afterwards that he was just trying to save Hogan from himself. Some deep stuff here to end Monday Nitro. Over on Raw, the WWF airs the Tell Me A Lie music video that was put together to garner some more sympathy for the injured heartbreak kid. I'm pretty sure everyone has viewed this at one point or another. Words can't do it justice, go and watch it for yourself after this video. I'm sure older fans at the time were cringing at some of this stuff 
stuff and it's one of those things in wrestling that has not aged well but still you should put yourself through it just to see how awkward you feel afterwards the whole thing is on youtube so you have no excuse it's another point for nitro i'm afraid as a grown wrestling fan it's extremely tough to sit through a music video featuring a love song about Shawn michaels no matter how good of a wrestler he was the video is quite iconic but that doesn't mean it's good especially nowadays Nitro started off with guns blazing, Eddie Guerrero and Ric Flair scored the first point this week on Reliving the War. Gorilla Monsoon and Goldust scored the next point for Raw, while Buddy Landell and Bob Holly had a boring match that went absolutely nowhere. Bobby Eaton and Sting got the next point for Nitro, and The Giant had an impressive main event match against Randy Savage that helped Nitro score yet another point. Finally, I'll tell Shawn Michaels a lie right now and say that music video was awesome. Nitro wins this week's Reliving the War, and yes, I botched the scoring last week. The proper final scores this week on Reliving the War are 4 points to Raw, 8 points to Nitro, and there's been 3 ties. Nitro also got the win in the television ratings this week, scoring a 2.7 over Raw's 2.5. The next episode of Reliving the War then will kick off 1996. I'll be sure to talk about the Christmas Day broadcast of WCW Nitro along with the Starcade results in next week's show. I hope you join me then and thank you for watching.